Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So, firstly, my apologies for the delay. Normally, I don't get late, but Delhi. I mean, the only thing that I mean, I was just thinking on the way that when it rains, the farmers are either happy or sad because you know either their produce is going to go up or down. When it rains in Delhi, the only concern to me is the traffic. <laughs> so that is how different priorities get. But by far, this has been the rainiest Delhi for a long, long time. I think for the past seven years, I don't think so it has been as bearable in Delhi during summer. But nonetheless, obviously the traffic also. So, will not make you wait any further. And start from where we had stopped yesterday. Okay, one more thing. Uh, if you see... Uh, you on your student portal, you'll also get something of a brief summary of the last class uploaded. Okay, so the whole idea of uh, keeping a brief summary of the last class uploaded is to uh, say if you have to begin revising any particular class, you know that okay, this was what was covered in the class. Okay, and so that you actually before you know before beginning or after you concluded you know your revision of that particular class you know you have a checklist okay. that in terms of I'm supposed to, I should have completed all these things or the teacher talked about all these things and it applies to all the lectures. So you'll have a brief summary for every class, for every lecture. So you should make use of it Okay, in that sense. Uh, now, we were uh, talking about, uh, we were talking about the whole aspect of the decline of the mobile rule. Then we talked about the major causes for the decline of the Mughal rule, the political, the economic, the socio-religious causes, and the causes related to the army, right? So we talked about that. We talked about how, for example, there were political succession disputes. That was one of the major reasons. Then we talked about how there was factionalism within the Mughal court itself. That was another reason. We talked about how the Jagirdari crisis itself was something that was pushing. Uh, yeah, just a second, just a second. Uh, we are talking about the Jagirdari crisis and how it was pushing uh, further decline in the economy. We talked about how the Jagirdari crisis itself was related to corruption within the army and was leading to weakness of the army itself. Also in brief, we talked about how Aurangzeb's religious policy of the imposition of Jazia was also responsible for the alienation of the uh, Hindu section of the society, which was a majority section in terms of its subject population. So all of these factors we talked about. Then we went on to talk about initially about the broad context of Bengal. How was Bengal also different from a number of other uh, Mughal states in the sense that both agriculture as well as trade were important sources of revenue. And within trade also one of the most important players became the Jagat Seth brothers who were bankers to both merchants as well as to uh, the bigger Jagirdars, right? So we talked about all of that. Yeah. How is Jagirdari crisis an economic issue? How is Jagirdari crisis an economic issue? See, the, so what he's asking is how is Jagirdari crisis an economic issue? See, one thing you have to understand that whenever you're talking of something that is at the interface of economics and politics, you can debate whether you want to keep it in politics as such or in economics as such. But why we, there are two reasons why we are keeping it in economics. That firstly the Jagirdari crisis is related to the economic issue that it is a fight over control over economic resources. Right? So amongst the elite. Okay. So for example one could say even a peasant revolt is not an economic reason. It's a political revolt one could say against the king. But one could also say that the peasant revolt is happening. Why? Because of high taxation. So that's an economic issue as well. So you could debate, you know, you could say that, sir, this should be pays under politics, this should not, this fits under politics as well. So obviously these reasons, and that is why in political uh, science or overall, you have a term that's called political economy of any issue, where you understand that politics and economics cannot be completely separated from each other. So one could argue that, sir, yaar agde, ki yaar agde. Another reason why we keep it in economy is that we have many points to write in polity anyways. Okay, so that's it. Uh, 
fees and rebellions can be talked about in terms of uh, so what he's asking is we can talk about fees and rebellions in terms of class exploitation okay in first class me if i start talking about class exploitation class will leave me okay so we're not talking about all of that for now okay so uh any more doubts from yesterday did you people get the time to go back and read okay see one more i'll keep giving you i'm the one who's supposed to keep giving you gyan pearls of wisdom of how not to do things while you starting on okay the first major thing not to do while you starting on is start reading newspapers everybody tells you to read newspapers right don't read newspapers initially at all i mean forget that there are newspapers because you're not going to make any sense out of them anyways okay you're going to waste 2 3 hours of the most productive aspects of your day trying to read a newspaper trying to understand what is important what is not important what is to be read what is not to be read why you not going to make any sense unless and until you have a background in polity and economy is that you are not familiar okay firstly with basic concepts of polity and economy secondly you also don't know what exactly to focus upon okay so you will be having a class for reading the newspaper in a couple of weeks okay you'll have a separate class on how to read the newspaper and all of that so don't do it secondly why i am saying you not to do it uh, is also because uh, of another aspect and that is that the initial 3 months as i always say to all the students that your initial 3 months are the most difficult 3 months okay in the sense that everything is new to you right the polity is new to you economy is new to you international relations everything is new to you so trying to deal with all new information at one time is something that's not a good strategy you first get your basics done with and that is why i say if you start in preparing fresh as zero candidate then don't go to the newspaper for the first 3 months for the first 3 months get your basics right that's the reason why you have your history polity economy geography all these classes lined up in the first 3 months so that you firstly get your basics up once you have that then slowly the polity teacher will tell you okay this is what is coming in the newspaper then you start limited connecting from there now also because what you need to do here is firstly just keep doing this what is done in the class that day just go back and do it that's it i know it sounds more it sounds way too simple as i don't know but two weeks down the line when you have two subjects going on simultaneously polity and history or history and economy then you have two things to focus on okay already two very new things to focus on so don't try and pick up a third kyunki abhi everything the initially the load would be less so you will be like i have some spare time at my hand why should i not start an optional Or why why should I not start the newspaper? So don't go beyond two new things at one point of time. Complete them as far as possible and then jump to the other. Okay? Don't I mean because you talk to somebody. अच्छा geography में क्या पढ़ना है? अच्छा economy में क्या पढ़ना है? अच्छा polity में क्या पढ़ना है? ये भी book I'll buy this book as well as this book, this book, this book, and probably read a chapter from every one. The result is you're making very small progress in all the directions and not any conclusive progress in even one of the subjects. So don't spread yourself thinly. Is the first point. Just stick to what is being taught. Okay. And also one thing that a lot of students have a problem with is optional, right? After some time, you are like, which optional to take, which does, which is not to take. Now my suggestion to you, in terms of selecting an optional, is that it is the most important choice which is going to determine. how good a rank you will get or whether you will get selected or not okay so it's something that you have to carefully choose don't rush into it so when i say don't rush into it is like just like saying you know your relationship with your optional is a long term relationship okay so don't rush into a long term relationship right where you have no choice like gs that's another matter but when you have to choose an optional be very careful know what you are interested in no see the previous year question papers see the 11th and 12th ncrts of that subject read them and then decide also see whether you have if at all you have any familiarity or any background all consider consider all these factors and then make a decision and you are not in a position to make that decision right now okay so for the first 3 months unless and until you already joined an optional coaching my suggestion is don't join an optional coaching for now because abhi for you gs is also new and optional is also new so it will become a problem 3 hours you spend in an optional class 3 hours you spend here 6 hours you sitting in the class after that you have to go and read everything together okay a better strategy is for the first 3 months you stick to what is being done here in the november session or so you join the 
you know, from the November onwards, December onwards, whichever optional you want to join, join it then because most of the new things that you're dealing with here would be done so that you can focus on the new thing which is being done in the class there. So you, you need to also look at a bit of time management and see which to start when and which to end when. Okay. So keep that in mind and so that's why I'm saying that don't rush into, you know, selecting an optional because what happens often is that a number of students who have written you know, uh, the mains initially once or twice and then they feel that this optional is not working out, they're not scoring as good and they go on and change an optional. So, I mean, almost midway into your UPSC cycle, if you change an optional, it's again a bigger problem. So choose your optional slowly, wisely and carefully. Okay, that's the takeaway. Now, uh, Okay, now let's uh, start our discussion from where we stopped in Bengal. Any other doubts from yesterday? Fine. Okay, so uh, where we stopped yesterday in Bengal, you can draw a timeline with me and basically that is something that will help us connect everything in terms of what led to the Battle of Plassey and the Battle of Baksar. Today first we'll talk about the Battle of Plassey and the Battle of Baksar. How were they important? What led to the wars and what is the significance of them? And then we'll talk about, and after that, we'll talk about, uh, Beng after Bengal, we'll talk about Hyderabad. Okay. Now, when we uh, talk about uh, Bengal, I told you that the first autonomous governor of Bengal was Murshid. Kuli. Now you have to remember Murshid Kuli's name, but not exactly the years. No need to remember exactly the years. After Murshid Kuli, eventually after a military coup, there came Aliwardi Khan. Aliwardi Khan himself was a military commander in the court of uh, Murshid Kuli, and after his death, he is the one who takes over along with the support of the Jagat Seth brothers. And he is the one who is at the helm of the power till his eventual death in 1756. 1755, uh, 1756 he dies and you see that 1755-56 he dies and then you see there is a succession dispute. Okay. Now in this succession dispute what happens is that between, as I told you, it is all Game of Thrones. Between his grandson and his daughter there is a succession dispute. On the one side is Siraj Dola, on the other side is Ghasiti Begum. One is his daughter, other is his grandson. And they have a succession dispute. And in this succession dispute, ultimately, you see that Siraj Uddola emerges victorious and he becomes the, again, the autonomous ruler. In 1750s. Six. Now, when Siraj Dola became the autonomous ruler of Bengal, he was barely 21, 22. Okay, so he was a very young ruler. Okay, uh, in the sense that he was barely 21, 22 at that point of time. And what is the significance of this fact is that as a young ruler, he was very different from Aliwardi Khan, and in fact he did not share a very close relation with the Jagat Seth brothers. In fact, he had come to power without any active support from the Jagat Seth brothers. So the Jagat Seth brothers did not share any very close political relationship with the new Nawab that would come into power. And at the same point of time, as had long been established factors, the Jagat Seth brothers had exerted a major control over the economic policies and had, had exerted a major control over the economic and the trade policies of Bengal. Now what do I mean by this economic and trade policies of Bengal? Is the fact that who should Bengal give trading rights? Whether to the British to do trade with Bengal? See what happened is, I will tell you exactly that Aurangzeb was the one who for the first time gave the British trading rights in Bengal in 1690. Okay. Aurangzeb was the one who first allowed 
the English East India Company to start, which is a private trading company, to start doing trade, the permission to do trade with the traders of Bengal. Okay. And for this, these traders, for this, the East India Company had to initially pay a one-time tax. And then over a period of time, these trading privileges were extended by every other ruler. So what you see is that what role the Jagat Singh brothers was pay, were playing was to decide whether, for example, the British should be allowed to do trade. If they should be allowed to do trade in how many districts in Bengal they should be allowed to do trade. What kind of a tax they would have to pay. Only the British should be allowed or also the French should be allowed or also the Dutch should be allowed. So, to allow trading privileges, to which trading partner, what kind of tax to be imposed, etc. All of these were economic policies. And the Jagat Seed brothers were, on a, were the important players in framing these economic policies. And they were also a part of uh, both Alivardi Khan's court and later also Sirajadola's court. But the problem arose because Sirajadola refused to comply with the advice of the Jagat Seed brothers and exerted and uh, asserted his own autonomy. He was of the opinion that and he could very clearly see that the Jagat Seed brothers who had been in the court, in, the, in Bengal's court long before he had come into power, were clearly very powerful. So his understanding and the young Siraj's understanding firstly was to subdue and was to discipline the Jagat Seed brothers and basically control and to reduce their control and increase his own direct control over the over not just the trade but more importantly over the whole framing of policies and in that sense what I am trying to say is that the asserted Nawab asserted wanted to assert his supremacy over the Bengali court and wanted to uh, ensure that the Jagat said brothers do not have a major control over the court. So what is what is he trying is that rather than being controlled by the Jagat Seed brothers who became the defining factor in defining the economic policies, he should be able to either reduce their influence or control them within the Bengali court. But then obviously the Jagat Seed brothers are like, like kid, he's just very new to the throne. You have not seen enough. We've been in the we we are the ones who frame been framing the policy for the past 15, 20 years. So we understand this much better and more importantly, we have vital economic interests which are linked in terms of granting trading privileges in the sense that the Jagat Seed brothers had become economically very powerful as well as very politically very powerful within the Bengal court because they were the ones who were not just bankers, but they were also themselves traders. Okay. So they were merchant bankers. That's why it's said that the Jagat Seed brothers, if you read some books, you'll find that some some books mentioned that the Jagat Seed brothers were actually merchant bankers. Meaning they were bankers, but they also carried out trade as well. And basically because they were the ones who would get decide, they were the ones who would decide who would get trading privileges. They were the ones to gain a maximum benefit out of it. It is as simple as saying that say tomorrow, uh, BSNL says that we will decide the telecom policies and BSNL itself is a service provider. So it would try and frame telecom policies which favor its market share or favor its growth in the market. Right. So to that extent, basically they were both traders as well as also defining the trading policy. So in that sense, they had vital economic interests to meet and that is why you know, they were important and also played an important role in framing the policies. Now, the important point is, what were they doing? The, the first thing that they were doing over a period of time is that I told you from 1690 onwards, the British wanted trading privileges and they were being granted trading privileges. So over a period of time, the English traders or the East India Company had developed a close relationship with the Jagat Seed brothers in the sense that doing trade with the Europeans was beneficial both for the Indian trader as well as the European trader. There is no exploitation of Indians which is happening at this point of time. Okay, Basically, they are buying, buying goods from Indian traders. Indian trader is selling goods to the European traders and the Indian trader is buying goods from the Indian peasants. So whether it is spices, whether it is silk, whether it is textile products, whatever, 
everybody is gaining it's a beneficial activity for indian trader as well as the european traders so on the indian side you see that the jagat say brothers have a significant amount of gains to make and so they on a over a period of time develop a close working relationship with the east india company and to that extent they understand the east india company also understands that if at all the jagat say brothers are subdued by the young siraj then in that position even their economic fortunes are likely to witness a decline and who is likely to gain because of their decline in the, in bengal is possibly going to be the french because we will see later when we'll talk about hyderabad that the period from 1740s to 50s is also a time when the british and the uh, french are also fighting in hyderabad okay or for the same thing a control over trading privileges and getting a monopoly over doing trade the context the contest between french and the english was not that both of them wanted trading privileges in bengal both of them wanted a monopoly over trading the contest between english and french in hyderabad also we'll see later was not to get trading privileges but a monopoly over doing trade now you could well ask sir why do they want monopoly over trade because they want to control the trade in that particular region one one could say sir why could they not peacefully do trade you know with indians both english and the french life would have been so much easier if everybody would have thought that way in the sense that it was a context it was a contest between the french and the americans already uh, french and the english already and to that extent this also has to be kept in mind we will see that one of the major reasons eventually for the overthrow of siraj ud daula was the anglo french rivalry also because the jagat because the jagat said brothers once siraj made it clear that he wanted to subdue the jagat said brothers it became clear that the fortunes of the east india company also would decline if at all jagat said brothers are thrown away so the east once it once this became clear and the english east india company also started taking in a number of steps so as to ensure that the jagat said brothers are not subdued and also in a way the best way of doing this was to basically overthrow siraj ud daula and so you will see that the british that the british or the east india company actually collaborated with the jagat said brothers in planning an overthrow of the young nawab okay and that is why you one could see that the jagat said brothers played a very crucial role in the eventual overthrow of the nawab of bengal and that is why i will say that the battle of plassey is also called the plassey controversy uh, conspiracy because it was not actually a war they didn't fight a war on the battlefield or as such i mean they want they had to fight a war but they didn't fight a war eventually because the jagat said brothers sided with the british and the british thus were able to very easily overthrow siraj ud daula without even having a major battle in the first place so that is why we say that the battle of plassey also was a bloodless coup okay it was almost a bloodless transaction there was no the, the nawab was neither captured nor killed anything of this sort and there was no significant fighting also which happened okay so we'll talk about that but this is the context and anglo french rivalry is also playing the and the english have developed a close working relationship with the jagat said brothers okay just keep this much of context in mind now why what precipitates matters is something that is important to know the anglo french rivalry you will see is one of the major causes why all of this breaks out the second major cause why all of this also breaks out is the assertive policies of siraj ud daula now siraj ud daula makes it clear he is young he feels the world is at its you know disposal when you are the king of a region you likely to feel that even further right so he he feels that he will obviously actually subdue the jagat said brothers he'll show them that he is the one who's in charge at the same point of time he'll just does take control of the court from the jagat said brothers at this point of time and for this basically and at the same point of time he's well aware that the british have developed a close relationship with the jagat said brothers so uh, he needs to do something about that as well now uh, at this point of time what happens is that the first shot comes from the east india company and the east india company starts voluntarily disobeying the terms of trade or the terms of conditions on which they had been granted trading rights in 
Bengal. One of the first conditions that they had been granted on which they had been granted trading rights was that they will not bring in weapons. They will not fortify or they will, so they were giving trading ports. So they will not fortify their trading positions. They will not bring in weapons to fortify their trading position. In defiance of this first condition itself, eventually the East India Company started bringing in weapons and fortifying their positions in the major port positions that they had got in Calcutta and eventually later in other places itself, other places, other trading positions in Bengal also. Now, Siraj was made aware of this uh, development that the East India Company was performing or fortifying its positions. But that was not the only thing. Another major reason which provoked the confrontation and provoked the Siraj, uh, provoked the Nawab to take an uh, offensive step was the fact that a number of refu a number of political uh, you know conspirators who were planning to overthrow the nawab and the nawab had basically debarred them from entering into bengal any further were basically being given shelter by the east india company so it was giving shelter to those political refugees who shared an antagonistic relationship with the young nawab so when the nawab was made aware of this development as well he said, enough is enough. We are the ones who are giving them the right to allow uh, doing trade in Bengal. And so he makes it a point. He first tries to sub he first tries to tell them not to resort to these actions. When this does not work, he launches a direct military assault over the East India Company in Calcutta and he takes up all their you know fortified positions and in as a as a punishment he also imprisons some 25-30 uh, British officials who were there at this point of time uh, in Calcutta into the fort itself and he locks them from outside. The result is by the next very day almost 15 out of these 30 or 20, uh, out of these 30-35 people die of suffocation itself Okay, in the room where they were locked. Okay, So this is something that's called a black hole tragedy. Okay, and this is something that's called as the black hole tragedy. And when this was widely reported in the British press that the Indians have resorted to such a barbaric practice and have basically, you know, compromised the lives of a number of British citizens of the East India Company. The East India Company was a private trading company. It is not a government-owned trading company. Okay, it's a private trading company just like probably any other trading company from India. Okay, one could say that we have today. So, to that extent, I'm just giving you context. It's not a government-owned company. It's not a direct attack on the British Empire. But it's an it's something that affects the life of the British citizens, right? Who are though are in their private capacity in India. So the black hole tragedy resulted in a situation which Rajatola firstly confiscated some key properties of the East India Company in Calcutta. Secondly, he it also led to a death of some 15 to 20 uh, British. Uh, East India Company officials in Calcutta. Now this is seen uh, by the British as a clear sign that the Nawab is trying to crack down and assert his authority. And at this point of time, what you will see is that there is a backlash obviously from the British where the, and the backlash that is coming from the East India Company is coming from South. I told you that 17, we will see this also, that 1740s to 50s is also the time when the British and the English, English and the French are fighting in South India, okay, in Carnatic region. We will see that. But so, a, a small army, a small but a significant army of the East India Company marches under the leadership of Robert Clive to Palasi, okay, and this is where the battle is supposed to play out. Okay. Now the battle is supposed to happen in Plassey, but it never happens. Primarily why? Because the Jagat Seed brothers were the ones who had already developed a close relationship with the East India Company and the understanding was that they would bring about a defection in the army of Nawab. So what they did was that once in 1757 when the battle of Plassey uh, broke out, we will see there was another individual who was a military uh, commander who was a military commander in the court of Bengal's, in the court of Sirajatola. He was a military commander and 
the Jagat Seth brothers assured them, assured Mir Qasim not to obey the orders of Siraj Tola. And Mir Qasim, basically, Mir Qasim and then there was Mir Jafar also. We'll talk about Mir Jafar also, don't worry. Okay. So Mir Qasim and Mir Jafar both of them were there. But uh, but you'll see that eventually that the military commander sides with the Jagat Seth brothers, and when the young Nawab basically gives an order on the battlefield to follow him into the war, almost half of his army doesn't even move because the military commander refused to obey the orders of the king, and this eventually resulted in Siraj Dola being forced to surrender to the East India Company. So the first major war that we associate with the arrival of British in India was not a war itself. So who is the original Desh Drohi? Take your pick. But what I am trying to say is, I am just making fun, in the sense that there is no question of who is not the first original traitor etc. Whether the Jagat Seth brothers or Meir Qasim or whatever. Meir Jafar. So we will see that. But basically that is not a relevant question. But what is relevant is from your examination point of view, firstly is the causes of the Anglo, uh, causes of the battle of Falasi. Once we talk about the causes, the events are not that important. But what was the consequence is even more important. So firstly, at the, at the same time you can draw uh, in terms of the causes. We will also complete this timeline. Leave space for this in your copy as well. Because we will add a few more things here. Okay, the AC, the AC remote, whoever has it, AC remote. Okay, so one advice, never sit under the AC. So if you're sitting under the AC, that's going to, always going to be a problem. So uh, now, so when we talk about the causes, let's very briefly firstly put, put the causes in terms of the first major cause which precipitated the war, one could say, was the Anglo-French rivalry. Now, how was the Anglo-French rivalry to the precipitation of the Battle of Plassey is the fact that the British suspected, and this I'm going to tell you anyway, when I'll write, you'll eventually figure out, that the British suspected that French would collude with Siraj to deny with collude with Siraj Dola to deny them trading privileges in Bengal. The French would subdue, the, uh, the British suspected the French basically would collude with Siraj Dola. They were clear that Siraj is not sharing a very good relationship with the Jagat Seth brothers. That means that Siraj is going to subdue the Jagat Seth brothers. And if he has to subdue the Jagat Seth brothers and the British, he is possibly going to look for somebody else to counter the British presence. And that support can come from the French. And it isn't it's, it's not a suspicion that is coming randomly to their mind. Because you will see later in the Carnatic region, this is exactly what had happened. The British had been thrown out of the Carnatic region initially because the Nawab of Carnatic had sided with the French. Okay, So they are expecting that a similar thing can happen if the Nawab of Bengal sides with the French. The British would be eventually thrown out. Also, because the Jagat Seth brothers who were close to the British, even they were not sharing a very good relationship with the young. Nawab. So we'll say that one of the reasons, now you could say that sir, you have causes mein political economic ho sab kar sakte hai. but you have nahi kar rahe hai, nahi fit hogi category. Okay. So we are saying that there are four major, we'll see that there are four major causes for the uh, uh, for the breakout of the Battle of Lassi. The first is the Anglo-French rivalry. One could say that this is a political cause also. Now, another, and because as I always told you that politics is related to economics, one could say this is partly economic also. Okay. Now, another major reason that precipitated 
the war is related also to the first reason and that is the assertive policies of the young Nawab. The assertive policies of the young Nawab and these assertive policies of the young Nawab, for example, was uh, taking over British forts or East India Company's forced forts in Calcutta and the subsequent black hole tragedy as a result of Siraj's actions. Now you don't need to explain what was the black hole tragedy in greater detail that 20 people died etc all of that black that's called black hole tragedy okay so that's in terms of the assertive policies of the young nawab the third may third reason also obviously related to all of this is the collusion of jagat seth brothers with the English East India Company. The collusion of the Jagat State Brothers with the English East India Company who felt threatened who felt threatened? I am saying the Jagat State Brothers who felt threatened by the young Nawab and thus sided with the British in the battle of Plassey. Is the writing visible till the last? Is the last writing visible? Okay. Uh, so these are the causes. The fourth major cause which we are anyways by now know uh, I mean, is that why has this all of this started? Is because, is because there is a political succession dispute in the first place, which results in, which itself just gets settled, a new Nawab is just coming to the town, and that is what precipitates matters, right? So we will see, we will see this pattern. Wherever the British intervened, whether in Hyderabad, or in Mysore, or in Marathas, except Mysore, in Marathas, or in Hyderabad region or in Bengal, you will see whenever there was a political succession dispute, that is the time when the British actually made a major intervention into the local politics. So another major reason which because of ideally which all of this began is the political succession disputes disputes after the death of Alivardi Khan provided a fertile ground for English intervention. Okay, so these are in terms of, see one of the things that you should learn uh, from what I am doing in the class, there is a, see there is a method to what you will see over the next 13 class, whatever I am going to write here is actually what you can write in an answer, beyond that you cannot write things in an answer, you cannot write 4 pages ka answer, neither the time nor the space will come, so we will talk about answer writing later, but a lot of, for example, some of you were asking me yesterday also after the class about answer writing, etc, etc. So for now, firstly, as I told you, don't think about answer writing. If you want to see how an answer is written, this is how it is written. 
you don't get into too much depth of elaborating any one particular point you try to give more emphasis to what are considerably important points but also firstly write in a point wise fashion and also give more points as well you don't write a clumsy paragraph where what you're used to doing in colleges right where you your job is to fill pages your job is to make the examiner feel that you have given in your effort and also make it painful for him or her to read so that they don't bother to read and they're just given the fact that you filled so much you written in a good handwriting they give you the credit and give you some marks right here the job is opposite is to give less pain to the examiner make him realize that you have written something because he has to read this okay there is no running away for this from this pain that you are going to inflict upon him year after year right so to that context if you write point wise if you write pinpoint that's what is expected in a answer so if you ever want you see uh, and guide to how can one write an answer on the say the causes of anglo french rivalry this is something that you actually can produce in an answer one could add further more details to this as well but this much should be there yeah this ban kar diye and aap inko hi remote de dijiye so they can possibly arrange among themselves so uh, any other doubts okay any other doubts apart from this in terms of hair okay now uh, what you need to understand okay we'll talk about this later what you need to understand here now we'll come back to this position okay so when we talk about this whole war or the battle of plassey it is initially you will see that the major military commander apart from mir jafar apart from mir qasim is also mir jafar and in fact mir jafar is actually the one who takes over the initial leadership of the army and who colludes with the jagat seth brothers eventually mir jafar is replaced by mir qasim okay so we will talk about why that happens because that explains why all of this is happening now before we get into this mir jafar mir qasim business what you need to understand that when you win a war you don't let the other side to walk out easily every time you win a war you impose a heavy financial or political cost on the opponent okay when the french defeated the germans they made them pay during world war 1 when the english defeated the young nawab who had already threatened their trading privileges who had already killed some of their company officers they obviously were going to make them pay and the first thing and this is called after the battle of plassey this is called the plassey plunder now why and this is why this plassey plunder is important you need to know some important points about the plassey plunder because if we talk about the significance of the battle of plassey and battle of buxar we'll see that these are the points that we're going to put there what one of the major significance we'll say of the battle of plassey and the next battle that also follows after this is that they basically led to huge financial gains for the east india company how did they lead to huge financial gains for the east india company firstly immediately immediately the east uh, the uh, new nawab of bengal and i told you that it was mir jafar who basically was the one who was in charge of the military commanders and it was mir jafar thus eventually who was made by the jagat singh brothers and the english east india company the next nawab because that is what he had been promised that you will be made the next nawab if you basically you know collude with us against the against siraj so basically mir jafar firstly made the next nawab but he is not just made the next nawab and given the control over whole of bengal he is firstly made to pay a war penalty of 275000 rupees okay so he is made to pay an immediate war indemnity also it's called war penalty or war indemnity okay. so he's, you he was made to pay a war indemnity of a major amount firstly secondly what is it that the british came after why did the british come to bengal for doing 
trade, right? So what did they want? Not just trading privileges, but also a monopoly over doing trade. So that is obviously something that they're going to extract. They extract a monopoly over trade with Bengal. They got a monopoly over trade with Bengal. That is what they wanted. They wanted that all Indian traders should be allowed to sell goods only to the English. And to that extent, this was itself a major positive for the East India Company. They are the ones, it's like saying that there will only be Geo. I mean, forget BSNL also. I mean, there are networks which make like BSNL, which make BSNL look good. Okay, Geo is one of them. Okay, so uh, in that context, for example, just like you go, if you go to hilly areas in India, right? The only network that you get there is BSNL. That is the only time you realize that the government exists. <laughs> okay, so in that context, the monopoly over trade with Bengal was something that was there. The third point, okay, apart from this, and this is an extremely important point, is that apart from paying an immediate war indemnity of 22, of 2,35,000 rupees, over the next five years, they were supposed to pay 22.5 million rupees more as a uh, indemnity to the English East India Company. So what do you see? The figure is not that important to remember, but if you have to write, you need to know some figures, okay? So this is something that you need to know that almost over the next five or six years, they had to pay a total of 22.5 million rupees as a penalty to the English East India Company. And that's a huge amount even for Bengal, because this you're seeing in the figures of that period of time, which is a huge sum of money, okay? So in that, see, in that sense, what do you see? That the Battle of Plassey becomes a huge financial bonanza for the East India Company. It becomes a huge boost, it comes as a huge boost to their finances. And Mir Jafar, who has been made the young new Nawab of Bengal, has to ensure that these conditions are met. But what he realizes is that if he's going to meet these conditions, then it is better not to rule in the first place. In the sense that he is not going to have any control over the economy because whatever is going to be raised as revenue will go to the British for the next five or six years. And he refuses to comply with these demands. After overthrowing Siraj coming to power, he refuses to comply with these demands of the British. The result is that the British, through the Jagat Seed brothers, get even Mir Jafar replaced. And now you have Mir Qasim coming to the throne. Okay, so eventually what you see is the inability on the part of Mir Jafar to meet these demands is what results in his replacement of Mir Jafar replaced by Mir Qasim. Okay, and now Mir Qasim comes to power. This is all happening between 1757 and 1763-64. Okay, in that seven or six or seven years period okay and we'll see later okay we'll see that later okay not often so about it but otherwise you'll get too confused so but what happens is that Mir Jafar is replaced by Mir Qasim Mir Qasim has initially happened then enlightenment dawns upon him also that there is no point being the king like this and so what he tries to do is something different in the sense that he tries to bring together the Nawab of Awadh so if this was Bengal, he tries to bring about together the Nawab of Awadh as well as the central Mughal ruler at this point of uh, time to form a kind of an alliance and make a combined attempt to overthrow the British. Okay. So he makes a combined, he makes an attempt to basically form an alliance with the Nawab of Awadh and the central Mughal ruler to try and overthrow the British or to try and remove the British from Bengal. Now, the, in Awadh, the ruler is Shuja Dola. Shuja Dola was actually the cousin of Siraj Dola. Okay, so he is the Nawab of Awadh. And the Mughal, central Mughal ruler is Shah Alam too. You don't need to remember, you know, see, whenever you don't remember anybody's name, suppose you don't remember 
Shujao, Shujao Tola's name in Avad. Okay. Then you write in your answer, whenever you're writing, Nawab of Avad. Collaborated, Ek do naam, bas, Nawab of Avad collaborated with Mir Qasim and the central Mughal ruler to make an attempt to overthrow the British from Bengal. Okay, that's also how you write. We'll come to that later. But whenever will an answer writing or should an answer writing stop? Because you don't remember the name of a king or you don't remember that the war happened in 1751 or 52. Okay, if it's happening in 1752 and you don't remember, you write in the early 1750s. There is no reason why you should stop from writing answers, but that goes on to say, but having said that, you definitely need to remember that this war has happened in 1757. So you can't write in your answer that uh, the Battle of Plassey happened in 1755. Okay, that should not happen because this is a very major date. Okay, or you can't write that 1857 war, the first war of, or the battle that happened, or what we call as the war of 1857, you can't write the war happened in 18, 1856. For few dates, you have to be specific. The rest, you can easily forget. Okay. So, 1757 is definitely that's a major date. But Mir Qasim thus tries to form a joint military uh, opposition against the British by bringing the Nawab of Awadh and the Central Mughal ruler together, Shah Alam too. And they form this alliance, try to, ma to make an attempt to, over to remove the British influence from Bengal. But why? Why is it that uh, Awadh is joining hands with Bengal. It's not because of any brotherly love, because the brother firstly is gone. And secondly, also because Abad can see the fact that if at all the British establish an even stronger hold over Bengal, then they are likely to, this is likely to threaten Abad in the very next place. So they understand that uh, the British are becoming an immediate threat. They anyway do not have any antagonistic relationship with the Nawab, with the erstwhile Nawabs of Bengal. So to that extent, they understand that the British will become a major threat. So it is important for us to make an attempt to overthrow the British. And so they join hands. The central Mughal ruler anyway was not a very major powerful player in his own right at this point of time. And he simply, given the, uh, given the uh, concerns of the Nawab of Bengal, as well as uh, the Nawab of Awad, he also decides to sign. And you see a renewed attempt, a refresh or a fresh attempt to basically drive the English East India Company out. Now, and this is what led to a combined opposition where in 1763-64, you'll see basically the Nawab of Awad, uh, uh, Shujao Tola, no need to be to, I mean, even if you don't remember the name, it's okay. Nawab of Awad plus the Nawab of Bengal, and that is Mir uh, Qasim at this point of time, and also the central Mughal ruler, that is Shah Alam II. See, in your PPT, wherever it's, wherever it's written, Shah Alam. 2, it's supposed to be 2. Okay, you don't write like this. But I didn't have the Roman numerals there, so I wrote it like that. Okay, so you, if you are ever writing, you should write it like Shalom 2, not this numeral 2. So, uh, these, they formed a combined opposition against uh, the British. But in, and this is what it was called as the Battle of Baksar. Baksar also was in Bengal and the battle of Baksar basically was actually a battle okay but even in this battle what happens is that when the battle actually is fought the British are able or the East India Company is able to defeat this combined opposition that was launched by Bengal, Awad and Mughals together. First question coming to our mind we say Mughal Empire was very powerful very this that and you see a private trading company defeating two Nawabs, etc. Okay, why do you, or one could say three, at least two Nawabs along with the central Mughal ruler. Why, why do you think this happened? They had more technology. They had more technology. Okay. Yes, technologically they were relatively better. But 
that's not the major reason why I take it. Disciplined army, financially more stronger. Anything else? Backside. I have just say, I have huge respect for people who are sitting at the back for two reasons. I have also sat sat at the back for a long time. Secondly, in the back there are people who either know too much or who are like this is not worth my time. So the backside. Any probable explanation? Yeah. They, they were able to grasp the weakness. They were able to grasp the weakness. What was the weakness? So uh, they were not strong from inside. The Mughals were not strong. From the inside. Mughals were not strong from inside. Support okay. Of local traders. They were. Support of local. Support traders. of local traders. So many explanations, many potential explanations. They'll tell you the major reason why they were defeated. Because the East India Company was actually a private trading company. So, so say. So they got reinforcements. They got reinforcements from the British. Uh, reinforcements from the British. Ha, kaha hai wo reinforcement? <laughs> nee, I am trying to see who answered. Ha, dekha. As I always said, people sitting in the black, absolute respect. Exactly this is the point. In the sense that the East India Company was actually a private trading company. But at the same point of time, and it's, it's just like saying like Reliance today, if it goes to do trade in Nicaragua or somewhere in Africa or in Latin America. It was a private trading company. But you will see, we'll see this later, that during the period of 1757 to 63, the British and are not just fighting here, they're also fighting in Carnatic region. Okay? And there the fight is directly happening between the British and the French. And the French East India Company is not a private trading company, it's a government owned trading company. And so when the French troops come in to fight, the English East India Company asks for the British crown troops or the British official army to also come in to support them. So it is actually by this point of time, the British army has also come in to firstly fight wars in the Carnatic and also ultimately help them subdue this battle of uh, or to subdue these Nawabs. So, in a way, one could say that the reinforcements that were brought in by the East India Company in the name, in the form of the British Army, was one of the major reasons why they could put up such a major fight. Okay, so that's also one of the reasons why you know they were able to defeat the uh, forces of the Nawab, Nawabs coming together. And there were other reasons also, I mean, in terms of technological, uh, you know, in terms of technological aspects also, they were relatively better. But alone, techno but the technological difference even at this point of time was not so much that a private trading company could have defeated the Nawabs. It was the reinforcement which actually changed the balance of power. And ultimately, you see that the Nawabs are defeated. And you see that the Battle of Baksar ends in a failure. Once the Battle of Aksar ends in a failure, Shah Alam too is told that you take voluntary retirement and now you just go and relax. We are not doing anything to you. And what we want from and we'll make the uh, make other than Bengal pay for the war because we won the war and they lost the war. And this is a war that you imposed upon us. So to that extent, everybody's written this. So to that extent, what happens after the Battle of Aksar? is something that's called uh, that basically was called as the treaty of Allahabad the treaty of Allahabad and the treaty of, of Allahabad basically imposed a series of conditions okay what was the series of conditions what did they get after battle of Lassi trading rights in monopoly over trade with Bengal, right? After the Battle of Plassey, the English got monopoly over trade with Bengal. Now, after subduing Avad, what do they want? The same thing. They want Avad to also give them exclusive trading rights or trading monopoly over trade with Avad. And this is going to be, all of this is going to be tax free. You see, even the monopoly over trade that they're getting in Bengal or here is actually tax free trade that they are getting. So that's the first thing that they'll get here. The second thing that they make the Avad pay is also an immediate war penalty. They make Avad pay a immediate uh, 
Avad eventually has to pay a war penalty of some 5 million rupees. Okay, so that's also something that's a major financial cost that they impose on Avad as well. And thirdly, but it was not just the Avad which had been subdued. Another major player which had been subdued again was the English. And this uh, were the uh, were Bengal. And now from Bengal, what more could they demand? They had taken revenue. They had taken monopoly over doing trade. Also, they had also placed an, a British resident in the court. In the sense that a British resident would also be placed in the court from 1757 onwards who would oversee the functioning of the court and see whatever is happening, oversee whatever is happening in the court to ensure that no adverse decisions are taken against the interests of the English East India Company in the court of Bengal. So British resident was also something who had been posted. What more can they take from Bengal? A direct, a direct rule. Well, they could, because what is happening till now is indirect rule. This is all indirect rule. They are not saying that we will remove the Nawab and we will become the Nawab of Bengal. Okay, so what you will see that the initial phase of the English East India Company's rule in India is not direct rule. It is indirect rule. They do not displace the local rulers, allow them to continue while trying to control major aspects of policies which directly, which directly affected their economic interests. So what was directly affecting their economic interests apart from all of this? Any guesses? What more can they find from Bengal without taking over direct rule? They don't take up direct rule. Without taking over direct rule, what more can they extract from Bengal? They've, get, they've got trading privileges. They're overseeing the decision-making process. They also get a war penalty. What more can they get? Yes. Till now, they were getting war compensation and trading privileges. And till now, they primarily functioned as traders. But now, to boost their finances even further, they are now even relying upon asking not just for trading rights but also the right to collect or the right to share a part of the revenue. Not the whole of revenue but a part of the revenue. It, would, it did not mean that after the Treaty of Allahabad, all the revenue for Bengal went to uh, the English East India Company but a part of the revenue is something that goes to the East India Company which asks for a revenue share from Bengal as well. So what do you see in the Treaty of Balapar? Firstly, that immediately a 5 million rupee compensation was to be paid by Avad to East India Company. Don't write short forms and answers. Okay. I'm writing, but I'm telling also. Okay. So firstly, a war compensation was paid. Secondly, what was done was an amount was that they got tax free trading privileges in Avad. Okay, tax free trading privileges in Avad. And thirdly, they also got, apart from tax free trading privileges in Avad, Revenue collecting rights. From Bengal. Now why am I telling you this? For example, they'll ask, even in prelims they can ask a simpler question like this. That with reference to the Battle of Lassi and Battle of Baksar, which of the following statements are true or not true? Okay, so for example, they'll ask that with reference to the Plassey plunder, what are, which of the following statements are true? They'll say that an immediate war compensation was paid, or the English East India Company got a monopoly over doing trade with India, or the over trade with Bengal. These statements are true. One statement would be that the East India Company got revenue collecting rights over Bengal. That is a false statement. They got the revenue collecting rights not with the Battle of Plassey, but with the Battle of Baksa. That's the key point and difference to remember. Okay, so that is something. So what do you see? So when we say the causes for Battle of Lassi, we also mean the causes of the Battle of Baksa. Okay, we are saying that the same, it's a chain of events, right? The inability to pay the war compensation here is in the Battle of Lassi is what is eventually leading to the Battle of Baksa, right? So the causes are interpreted. The same thing that we've talked about 
as the causes for battle of kasi eventually applied to the battle of baksar as well we are not going to separately look at the causes for the battle of baksar they are the same causes also when we talk about these causes similarly in one go for both the battle of plassey and battle of baksar we also talk about consequences of these battles in one go okay what is the major consequence the first major consequence of this battle is dekhiye we often say in common understanding that with the battle of plassey it became clear i mean with the battle of plassey it became clear that the british are here to stay and will eventually become the next pan indian player no that's not true yes it is the battle of plassey which marks the establishment of presence of british in bengal but or which marks the establishment of british uh, british presence in india but to say that they were, it, this is the battle which marked their presence to extrapolate and from which to extrapolate and say that now it became clear that they would go on to rule india is a far call it was not at all clear in the sense that it was not just the british who were you know a powerful player but even a more powerful player than the british at this point of time were the marathas up till 1760s was the marathas also marathas were a powerful player in south india mysore was a very powerful state so yes it became an important that's why shikhar padapatya writes that with the battle of plassey the british mark the the establishment of their presence in india and become a major contender for the british for the indian throne a contender meaning that there were other contenders as well who were also either powerful as powerful or even probably more powerful also who could have become who could have uh, you know uh, occupied a position of becoming the next pan indian empire so i mean don't think that just because they defeated bengal it meant that they would go on to become the next pan indian empire which was not the case they were one contender so what is we'll see that what is the significance of battle of plassey and battle of baksar firstly is that it was a major boost to the revenues and finances of the east india company the east india company had been fighting a lot of wars in the carnatic region also in the in, in the hyderabad region also and also in bengal with the french as well as with many other local rulers so in the backdrop of these frequent wars that the east india company was fighting which was a private company a significant boost to the revenues that was coming because of the plassey plunder and the treaty of alawar meant that it was a huge boost to their finances so what do you say that the first major consequence is that it was a huge boost to the finances the second major consequence is that it marked the establishment of the east india company's presence in india and made them a contender one of the major contenders in 18th century to the indian uh, indian indian throne or the indian crown or to be a indian pan indian empire there are two major consequences okay and uh, with and so these are the two major consequences that we talk about in terms of this war that the british establish Uh, the toehold they establish their toehold in india they become a major contender to the throne and also they get a huge boost to their financial reserves okay so these are the two or three major consequences beyond that we don't need to get into anything yeah so if the east india company is fighting so many wars isn't it financially uh, a loss for the british government it is okay we'll talk about this so what she's asking is that if the east india company is fighting so many wars isn't it a financial loss for the british government the relationship between the east india company and the british government we'll talk about in uh, in I, i think two or three lectures from now in the sense that we'll see that the east india company was that the british government was not blindly supporting the east india company in fact they made even the east india company pay the british government in exchange for the support of the army that they were getting so a part of the east india company's revenue initially was even going to the british parliament to pay for the support of the british army to the east india company now how were they bearing all of these expenses is essentially because the east india company had been firstly making profits historically because east india company was one of the major predominant trading company not just with india but with also with china 
okay and so they had account accumulated certain amounts of profit and secondly also what one neat thing that you need to understand that if you if you, this is this is a long term game they very well see that if at all they make progress here it will lead to immediate dividends and that is why you see that 1757 they get the initial initial you know significant financial boost 1763 they also get a financial boost and they also now not just being traders but also becoming you know uh, revenue collectors to an extent so this becomes a sustainable source of revenue fighting two wars which give you so much money is much better than doing trade for years or together two wars in 7 years and you make money so for example that is why we say war is one of the major drivers of economy throughout the world even today for example we say that the great depression something that happened in 1929 in united states basically affected the whole world this is like the recession that happened in the world after 2008 and the great depression only ended the major de- depression of the economy ended which started in 1929 only with world war 2 why because the world war 2 again boosted demand <clears throat> so what i'm basically trying to say is that these wars were not a losing proposition to the east india company because they got major financial benefits because of fighting these wars and you will see that in the meanwhile they also fought in carnatic region and there also they fought huge financial benefits so these are quick wars that they fought again these wars do not span out for too long it wasn't that from 1757 they were fighting in 1764 a war happened in 1757 then in 1764 okay so these were small wars decisive wars and for example battle plassey was not a war at all they didn't fight at all and they still got such a good deal so these were good activities for the east india company any other doubts till here so one more yeah from bengal like why would a ruler want to be a ruler if he has why to- would be so what she is asking is that they are collecting uh, that's why i said that they are collecting a part of the revenue not the whole revenue so what she is asking is that if they are collecting the revenue from bengal why would a ruler want to be a ruler if they do not have a control over the revenue so that's why i said that only a part of the revenue they are collecting not the whole revenue and secondly the ruler does not have much choice you see you being completely military subdued militarily subdued by the british so you have to accept the terms of conditions or what else don't be a ruler like what do you be, what will you be so in that sense that because you don't have any other option you have to accept it so uh, in terms of the impact thus as i told you that it gave both these wars right both these wars they gave a british they gave the british a toehold in india made them a major contender to the throne made them a major contender don't write to the throne made them a major contender to be the next pan indian empire because if i say the throne aisa lagta hai ki ek throne rakha hai and they you going to go where that and then you become the next ruler no that's not like how it was so that's there and the third major thing up after this is that they give the british a toehold in india they made them a major contender to the next pan indian empire and the third is also that both these battles were a huge financial boost to the east india companies reserves so that is something that is important now this this and this three major important consequences the question will never come 
uh, in terms of just saying what is the major consequence of the war, but only as a part of what we've already done. So how did India enter in a modern age after the Battle of Lhasa? Please explain. What modern age? No modern age. And not read books which say that we entered into modernity with Battle of Lhasa. Okay. So uh, in the sense that one of the online students asking a question that how did India enter into a modern age after the Battle of Palasi? Now there are two explanations for this. The first thing that you need to understand the term modern can be interpreted in many ways. Modernity can be interpreted in many ways. You could say modernity is the idea of equality for all or the idea of the French Revolution in the social sphere of defining what is modernity, the idea of the French Revolution are associated with modernity. But what is being asked here, possibly what the student understands and what is possibly something to be read somewhere, is that the Battle of Plassey ushered in uh, how did India enter into a modern stage of uh, age after the Battle of Plassey is that when the British came to India and they started establishing their administrative presence, they brought in a series of administrative changes that you see associated with a modern state today. We'll see this later that the British brought in many changes in the structure of the army, in the structure of the economy, in the way to collect taxes and the way to administer India or administer its colony in India, which is similar to the kind of administrative structure that you see in modern states throughout the world today. For example, they did not fuse the revenue collecting responsibilities and the responsibility of maintaining the army in one authority. They had separate revenue collecting officials and separate army. That's how a modern state is organized, right? You don't see the army also collecting the revenue. So to that extent, that is what this question is actually indirectly hinting at. That how was it, you know, a step in the direction of establishing a modern state in India? In the sense that you find that when the British start establishing administrative presence, they bring in structures of administration which are associated with that of a modern state. No need to get into it. We'll talk about this much detail later when we talk about British administrative structure. That how was that their administrative structure similar or different from that of the previous rulers? And what do we mean by the modern state? Okay. Now so these are the causes or the, these are the impact. Now, uh, you can write the cause, you can write a question. You will not be able to answer this right now, but just write it. We will talk about this later. The Anglo-French rivalry The Anglo-French rivalry played a critical role in defining the political future of 18th century India. The Anglo-French rivalry played a critical role in defining the political future of 18th century India. Discuss. Okay. The answer I have not discussed with you till now. I have just talked only one aspect of the Anglo-French rivalry, how it impacted political future of 18th century India. So don't worry, don't try to write an answer, it's not meant for you also right now. But we will see how Anglo-French rivalry is playing out in Bengal, in Hyderabad and also in Mysore. Okay, so it's not a question, this question is not about the about Anglo-French rivalry in Bengal, it's about in the whole of India. And your answer, thus whenever you will write it, will basically focus upon a part of how Anglo-French rivalry fueled uh, also the Battle of Plassey in Bengal, how it played a very critical role in the Carnatic Wars and also how it was partly responsible also for the anglo mysur Wars later. But I'm just, yeah. It's I, not an assignment. It is not an assignment question. Yeah. It is not an, see one question I'm giving you are not directly assignment question. Okay, but this is something that you'll use to reflect upon and think about when you are revising reading later. Okay, so that's there. Another question that you can write down.
the battle of parasi is often termed as the key event which signified the decline of mughal rule in india in the light of in the light of the above statement in the light of the above statement discuss the causes that led to the war and its significance <coughs> for 18th century india and its significance for 18th century india now is question may you see there is a first line which is not a question it is just a line this is just meant to in you know this is just meant to lengthen your question make you feel that the question is asking something complex or something two or three things which is essentially not the case the first line is just sitting what one could say in india's mahol sadar right? in the sense that we often say in U upsc the longer the question is the easier the question is the smaller the question is the tougher the question is the first question that i dictated to you is a very small one liner but that question does not even mention exactly what it is asking it is not because it does not mention that it is talking about anglo french rivalry in either hyderabad or mysore or bengal you have to write about all three of them the th second question in contrast is very simple and straight forward what led to the war the causes and also the significance so never get afraid if you get a three or four line question and normally that happens often in uh, especially in paper 2 and uh, paper 3 you'll see later that often happens it happens in paper 1 as well so whenever you get these kind of statements you know two three liner question be rest assured it's going to be an easy question okay so this is the question simply of the causes as a consequences now let's get any doubts you have it's fine next now let's get to the next thing and that is about hyderabad okay now also you can just draw a brief map with me first obviously you're not going to draw this anyway but it's just for your understanding because uh, i mean you will get to know what is happening i told you about one theta it isn't in fact for example if you read spectrum okay spectrum doesn't talk about uh, you know bengal in one go okay spectrum does not talk about bengal in whole one go they will talk about a particular year say 1757 and they will see that what is happening in bengal in that year in hyderabad in that year or in other parts of the country in that year okay so that way it would become actually a bit more difficult for you to see what is happening in one particular zone you will have to connect what is happening in 1757 etc so it becomes a more difficult exercise so you don't need to do that you just will that is why i am doing it region region wise there is it does not mean that firstly the british aimed at bengal then they aimed at hyderabad no they were parallelly following a lot of things so to give you a sense of what is happening parallelly this is just for your understanding don't draw these maps any of this in your gs answers okay gs answers no history maps geography maps yes history maps no history optional students do draw history maps but not for you know gs but this is for your understanding that i told you that these battles are happening between 1757 to 1764 we'll see that in the same period in fact 
before the war that started in Bengal from 1740s to 1763 there were wars happening between the English and the French in Hyderabad and these were called as the Anglo Carnatic wars there were three Anglo Carnatic wars which were happening we will see later that by 1763 the British had defeated the English, uh, the British had defeated the French in the Hyderabad region. By 1763 we will see that in Hyderabad they defeated, subdued the French and by 1764 they are even establishing the presence in, in Bengal. So you see that both Hyderabad and Bengal are simultaneously almost coming under the indirect control of the British at almost the same time. But again, this does not mean that they are just fighting here. There are a number of things also which are happening. I am putting all of this together because baad mein fir aapko yehi samajh mein ki what was happening where when. Okay. Third battle of Panipat. That is also happening in 1761. Between whom? Between Marathas who are siding with the British, uh, who are siding with the Mughal ruler, central Mughal rulers against the Afghan invaders. Yeah, Ahmed Shah and others. Afghan. Invaders. Okay. So a number of things are happening. You see, 1761, the central Mughal ruler is fighting a war with the Afghan invaders. 64, they are fighting with you know uh, with the British, etc. So a number of things are happening. It is not that That's not that is something happening. There are number of action, there is a good amount of action taking place in a variety of uh, political theatres. Okay, so that is something uh, that is there, but also another uh, major place. Once the British had subdued, the British had no role to play in the third battle of Panipat. Okay, but it is happening, so I am telling it to you in one place. The British, thus initially, were able to by 1764, uh, 63 in Hyderabad and 64 in Bengal, were able to subdue the local rulers, and the next major focus that uh, they focus upon the next two people, you know, the, the two major princely states that are left as Mysore and Marathas. And they make an attempt on the Marathas in 1775 to 1782. We'll see this that 1775 to 1782 is also what is called as the first Anglo Mysore War, Anglo Maratha War. But then the British realized that they were not successful in defeating the Marathas. So they realized that Marathas are a very strong power at this point of time and, we, and they couldn't defeat Marathas even for a war that stretched on and off for a period of 7 to 8 years. Okay? So they realized that they couldn't defeat the Marathas. So they, they understood that instead a better strategy for now would be to leave the Marathas alone for a better opportunity at a later point of time. And now they focused upon Mesur. And you see that roughly the same time again, it isn't that they are just fighting with uh, Marathas at the, at the same point of time, also a war eventually breaks out in Mesur. And you will see Mesur also fought a series of wars from uh, 1770s, mid 1770s to ultimately 1799 and these were four Anglo Mesur wars, which ended in 1799 when Tipu Sultan was killed by the British. Okay, and then you see that by 1799, Bengal, Hyderabad, and Mesur have been subdued. But I told you that with Marathas, they realized that the opportunity or the time was not correct. 
and they were not in a position to subdue Marathas directly. But once Marathas had been surrounded by the British from three sides, and also because of other reasons, because of which the Marathas themselves were becoming weak, you see that after 1799, over the next two wars, the second and the third Anglo-Maratha wars, the British finally subdue the Marathas by 1815-1817. And finally, in 1817, they subdue the Marathas as well. So why am I telling you this story is firstly to see a semblance of, you know, what exactly is happening in so many spheres at almost the same time periods. And secondly, to understand even one more thing from here. Firstly, we'll see later that Mysore was a strong state. But one of the, and Shekhar Bhattapadhyay says this later, that the only possible displacement for the Mughals, apart from the Mughals, after, the only possible replacement after the Mughals uh, who had the potential to become the next Pan-Indian Empire were the Marathas. Given the fact that they were, we'll see their territorial reach was much larger, they were definitely more powerful as compared to other princely states. But even they failed to do so. What are the causes etc. we'll see later. But what, else, what is to be understood also is that Marathas were the last to be subdued. Also, this was reflective of the fact that they were a major power to reckon with. Okay, And so this also is meant to give you some another important view that what is important from all of these things for your mains examination is the causes of the Anglo-Mysore war and the impact of the Anglo-Mysore war, uh, Anglo-Carnatic uh, Anglo wars. Similarly about the Anglo-Mysore wars, their causes and their significance, the causes and significance of the anglo Maratha wars and the significance of the third battle of Panipat, its causes, etc. Okay, so that's only that is going to be relevant for your examination point of view. What exactly happened in these wars is not something that you're going to write in your answers. I'll anyway tell it to you in the class so that you have some understanding. But this is not going to be okay uh, there now we let me show you a map because before we get any further you need to know this and in the sense that when we talk about Hyderabad that's the next thing that we're going to talk about you need to see this map and also understand what we are talking about Forget these two maps, forget the years, forget any labeling and forget these two, just look at this one. Okay. So when you look at this map, what you see is that uh, Mysore is an important state here. This is how were the territorial boundaries of Mysore, somewhere one could say in 1760s. Okay. Apart from Mysore, another major important player was Hyderabad. Okay. And Hyderabad, just like in Hyderabad, I told you, Nizam al Mulk Asaf Jahan 1, we'll see, as I told you yesterday also, that Asaf Jahan 1 had later went on to become the autonomous governor of Hyderabad. So, he had also established an autonomous province for himself in Hyderabad. And we'll see that just like uh, uh, there was a Nawab of Hyderabad, there was also a Nawab for what was known as the Northern Sarkars. Okay, and there were also Nawab for what was also known as this region was also called as the Carnatic region. Okay, so this is not what is called as the Carnatic region. This is Deccan. This is Carnatic. Okay, obviously my boundaries are not any way commensurate with the boundaries of India today or the Carnatic region or whatever. But the Carnatic region basically existed on the eastern, southeastern coast of Bengal and there was a Nawab for the Carnatic region as well. Now, for the Carnatic region, the Nawab who existed was the one who was supposed to report to the Nawab of Hyderabad. Okay. The Nawab of Hyderabad was supposed to oversee the working of the Nawab of Carnatic under the Mughal structure. But just like the Nawab of Hyderabad had become autonomous, the Nawab of Carnatic had also become autonomous of the Nawab of Hyderabad. Okay. So basically, the, he was also an autonomous ruler 
in the Carnatic region. Because students often confuse the Deccan with the Carnatic and then they start asking later what is Northern Sarkar. So this is Northern Sarkar, this is Hyderabad, this is Carnatic. Just get a sense of what is there. Don't look at the maps, we'll come to them later when you talk about Anglo Mesur Wars. Okay. So if that much is clear, the next thing that we're going to talk about is gangs of <laughs> gangs of Asafar. In the sense that this is a very wonderful and fascinating story. I mean, obviously not important for your examination point of view, but to understand what led to the war, the Anglo. Carnatic Wars. The Anglo-Carnatic Wars basically happened because of a number of reasons. Firstly, I told you the Anglo-French rivalry is already there. Now, the Anglo-French rivalry was already there, right, between the English and the French on the same issue of getting trading privileges and trading rights. Now, we'll see, and you can draw another timeline with me, which will actually summarize the whole three wars and what led to the wars also, okay. And see, whatever timelines that I'm giving you, frankly, they are enough for you to get a sense. If you have read before, if you followed in the class, they're enough for you to get a sense of what, you know, happened in these wars. More than that, you don't need to get into the details of which battle happened, where, who defeated whom, all of that, okay. So you can draw it with me. So, okay, before we get into any, any further discussions, how is life going on? In the sense, how many of you have lived in here nearby, Madindanagar, Karol Bagh, Patel Nagar? Okay. Uh, or how many of you don't live in these areas? Okay, the class is almost equally split. How many of you are from Delhi? Okay. The rest have come from various parts of the country to make Delhi a more cosmopolitan <laughs> exercise. Okay. So how many so how many of you are coming to Delhi? I mean this is your first time when you're coming to stay in Delhi. Oh my God. Do you like Delhi? How many of you like Delhi who are coming for the first time? Okay, few. That speaks about the reputation of the city anyways. Okay. I mean if you go to Delhi, Delhi is like the worst Metro, amongst all the metros in India. The only good thing about Delhi, by far above all other metros in India, is only the roads. It's another matter, the roads are unsafe, but you have broad roads, okay? You have big roads. That's only. If you go to Bangalore, the roads are like this. Bangalore, I say, is one of the most, uh, is a reflection of what happens, you know, when there are so many engineers, but they lack vision. <laughs> They stuck on the road all the time. It takes one and a half, two hours from the airport to go anywhere. You live five, seven kilometers from here to somewhere. It will take you almost an hour to travel seven kilometers. By far, the traffic is bad. And whenever I think of how, you, you just come to think of this fact. India's biggest corporate sectors in the IT industry are located in Bangalore. They fail to find a simple sustainable solution for moving population from one working place to another. That is why smart cities don't come just like that. The whole idea of smart cities is also something that is very often questioned. Also why this rant is happening because of the traffic today. Secondly, also urbanization is a very major important topic in your paper 3. Smart urbanization is a, I mean, it's a subtopic. Whenever you're reading, say, whenever you read, start reading the newspaper, anything that is coming on urbanization is this new topic which was added to your syllabus. And you'll see a lot of this keep happening. You know, somebody's talking about smart cities, somebody's talking about urban mobility solutions, all of these things. So that's also something that is there. So, I mean, yeah, and Delhi, frankly, doesn't have much to offer except from roads and Mughal architecture. <laughs> but, I mean, and yeah, food also probably, but yeah, not in terms of anything apart from that. And yeah, the people are as rude as they can get. <laughs> that's, that's the de facto here. I mean, but uh, so nonetheless, and also people don't like to stand in queues, right? They just don't. And the conception of queue doesn't exist. You go to Bangalore, yes, it does. I mean, Mumbai, definitely way more civilized people than Delhi. But... I mean, that's there. Nonetheless, okay. So, when we talk about Hyderabad,
what we see is that from early from 1724 till 1748 again dates are not important to remember you see asaf jahan one who is also known by the name of nizam ul mulk was the governor he was the governor and he became more or less autonomous of the central mughal rule he also brought in a few changes in the administrative structure of hyderabad as well but we don't need to get into that detail one thing i'm just telling you is that what major change that he brought one of the major things is that he brought was he made jagirdari hereditary in these areas and so basically it became zamindari in some of these areas of he gave certain jagirdaris uh, to as in a form of a hereditary manner and thus you see the rise of some of the zamindars in these areas of hyderabad but one thing again even when this is zamindari becoming and it's becoming hereditary the king could any day take it away i mean if the king would take away from a zamindar's family their land what would the zamindar do he could not go to the court right and say that the king has to return my land so even when you had this hereditary conception why i am telling you this because of a later difference that i am because you will ask me later when we will take discuss the british the british we say brought in the right to property this is not right to property it is in that zamindars in hyderabad have a right to property because a right to property means that it's a right right whenever you we use the term right me we say it is legally enforceable meaning if somebody else takes away your property you can approach the court which is not the case here. okay so it's not equivalent to a right to property it's just that he is making you know jagirdari uh, hereditary and that's called zamindari for now iske dada aapko nahi padhne ki zarurat hai is bare mein okay so that was and so asaf jahan one was also one of the last major strong rulers in hyderabad and after the death of asaf jahan one in 1748 you see the first major problem breaking out is that after his death becomes a begins a succession dispute and this is the succession dispute that i was referring to when i said that we'll talk about gangs of wasipur in the sense that there are two parts to this story one of the succession disputes begins in hyderabad after the death of nizam ul mulk another succession dispute breaks out in the carnatic region in the in the period of nawab of carnatic okay but why did the succession dispute break out in carnatic region i have not told you that right to understand this we also need to understand that something that was happening from 1742 to 1748 okay this is called as the first anglo carnatic war the first anglo carnatic war happened before 1748 itself okay and this first anglo carnatic war was essentially happening this first either this first anglo carnatic war was essentially happening primarily because of the fact that the, there was the anglo and the french rivalry and this anglo french rivalry was happening here in the carnatic region because the french because the french had attacked a number of trading positions of the english in the carnatic region in the same they started initially with the french attacking the english position in the carnatic region and why did they attack ab aap ye puchhenge the anglo french rivalry here was placed playing out because there was also a succession dispute in austria in the habsburg empire and in this succession dispute both the english and the french were trying to get a ruler installed in the habsburg empire who was closer to them so there was a succession dispute that broke out in europe which was a reflection of the wider anglo french rivalry but the and thus soon war broke out in every other areas where the english and the french had close trading positions because of this the first anglo carnatic war that broke out here the french attacked english trading positions in the carnatic region as a result the english approached the nawab of carnatic 
for help. The English approached the Nawab of Karnatak for help against the French uh, uh, attack on their trading position in the Karnatak region. Obviously, the Nawab of Karnatak, who is in charge of affairs, is the one that the English look up to with the hope that the Nawab would come to their rescue and basically defend them against the British. And this is what their expectation is. The Nawab does come to the rescue of the English against the French in 1742. Okay, in this period from 1742. But it is the first anglo karnatic war we say is where the French defeated the English. The French defeated the English in the first anglo karnatic war and so also defeated the Nawab of Karnatic. Nawab of Karnatic had come to the uh, rescue of the uh, English, but the Nawab was defeated in the first war. And the result was that all English trading positions in South India were taken over by the French. So what do you see that initially in the Anglo-French rivalry, who were the ones who were more successful? The French. And that is why the English are not being paranoid when they are thinking in Palasi or in Bengal that what has happened in Karnatic can also happen in Bengal region. That the French would possibly could ally or could probably throw out the English from the Bengal region as well as they had done in the first anglo Carnatic war in 1748. Okay, So now by 1748 they firstly defeat the Nawab of Carnatic and obviously once they defeat the Nawab of Carnatic the Nawab has to pay for this and what he has to pay is that Ultimately, we'll see that the French use this opportunity to interfere in the affairs of the Carnatic region. Okay, we'll see. And so th this is the first anglo Carnatic war which plays out. But by 1748, though the French had defeated the English in India, the English had defeated the French in America. So that is why we say that uh, the war if there was a world war before the first two wars, it was these wars of 1740s to 60s that were playing out between the French and the English in Europe, in South Asia, in America. So in, in America, you don't need to write any of this. In America, it was the English who had defeated the, the French. So by 1748, they reached peace. They said, you give back our colonies in India, English said you give back our colonies or our uh, trading positions in India, not colonies, it would be incorrect to say colonies, trading positions in India and we'll give back your trading positions in America. They reached the deal, 1748, you know, that's some sort of a peace coming back. But that's not all, in the sense that but the East India Company, but the French were not very happy in settling down uh, like this. And though they gave back the trading positions to the English, they did not do something. And that is that firstly they did not leave Carnatic alone. Now they realize that the Nawab of Carnatic has sided with the British. So we should do something about this Nawab and probably get somebody who is closer to us on the throne of Nawab or on the throne of the Carnatic region. So in the Carnatic region, they are going a step ahead and they are basically, they get the Nawab of Carnatic assassinated. And this Nawab is Nawab, not Nawazuddin, but Nawab Anwaruddin. He gets, they get Nawab Anwaruddin, who is the Nawab of Karnatik, assassinated. And in place of them, in place of the Nawab, they place Chan Sahib. Chan Sahib, who is one of the important nobles in the court of the Nawab of Karnatik, is made the next Nawab. But, as I told you, Pasipur happened in two parts. This was happened in two parts. Even though the king or the Nawab of Karnatik died, his son escaped. And Sabka Badla Lega, the son of <laughs> Nawab of Karnatic. And Nawab of Karnatic basically escapes, uh, the son of the Nawab basically escapes, and he is looking now for allies to get back at Chan Sahib. And who is going to be his ally? The British. The, British, yeah. the French 
are the ones who have you know overthrown and killed his father so he is looking at an possible ally and the british are more than happy to get a chance to again play an important role here but so there was a succession dispute that was manufactured by the french here okay but in in hyderabad there was already a succession dispute after the death of nizam al mulk and you see between again game of thrones between the son and the grandson of nizam al mulk nasir jang and muzaffar jang between again names are not important to remember i'm just telling you okay none of these names you need to remember possibly if you want to remember one one could talk about muzaffar jang that's it okay even if you don't remember it's okay now the succession dispute happened between nizam between nizam son that was nasir jang and muzaffar jang and ultimately what happens is that just like in the carnatic region the french had got their candidate installed in a similar way in the succession dispute the british sided with nasir jang whereas muzaffar jang was supported by the french and the result is that the french emerge victorious in the sense that their candidate muzaffar jang defeats nasir jang and thus you see that both in hyderabad and in carnatic where the french intervene they are able to get candidates who are closer to them installed on the throne if they are going if are, so in the anglo french rivalry by 1748 and this is all happening in 48 the, this war plays out in a manner that immediately after the war there are succession disputes in which both the english and the french intervene the french interventions prove out to be more successful in the sense that they get uh, Uh, those uh, they get uh, they get those leaders appointed to the thrones who are closer to them the result is that now since the leaders or since the rulers of both hyderabad and carnatic share a closer relationship with the french the french are likely to be bestowed with what what did the french come here for i'll come to you what did the french come here for trade, trade. so now what the french get also is trading privileges and the result is that the substantial firstly the british so firstly the french got substantial territorial hold over northern sarkars i showed you northern sarkars in the map they were given as a jagir meaning a right to collect taxes a right to collect taxes was given to the french from the northern sarkars by the nawab of hyderabad okay and basically this meant that this was a huge boost to the french right so in that sense they firstly got a control of northern jag uh, northern sarkar the jagi and also their important trading positions in pondicherry all these areas were fortified even the villages outside around pondicherry were handed over to the french so that they could maintain a control over them so this was a huge boost to french presence but this is only part 1 part 2 has to play out again the french are the ones who emerge victorious from this first war from these succession disputes so it seems that both uh, the son of nawab anwaruddin and basically that is his son mohammad ali and an ironic mohammad ali is like one of the biggest best fighters in boxing history right so but nonetheless mohammad ali is nawab anwaruddin's son who has fled who has managed to escape and one of the main architect of the french policy here you know of intervening in succession disputes and manufacturing of succession disputes when none existed is that of the military general duplex and duplex thus become a big nuisance for the british okay he is a he is a able uh, french military general and more important than being able he is actually he he sees that here is a big future for him and he starts doing his own personal trade he starts investing money in many other trading activities apart from being a french east india company official so he decided that i am going to stay here for long okay and that i am the one who will be the architect of the french policies here okay so it is in this context that one needs to know this this much about duplex that he was a important french military general now what happens <coughs> is that this leads to the second war the picture does not end here because the british also are looking for a comeback and this comeback comes from 1749 to 1754 the 1749 to 1754 is something that's called as the second
Anglo-Carnatic War. What happens in the Second War? In the Second War, Gangs of Vasipur 2 happens. Muhammad Ali comes back to take revenge for the death of his father. He sides with the British. Now the British are successful. Now Muhammad Ali is successful. He gets Chan Sahib assassinated and he becomes the Nawab of Karnak. Here, Nasir Jang, who had sided with the who had been supported by the British, had been ousted initially, and Muzaffar Jang had come to the throne. Now, in the second war, Muzaffar Nasir Jang is being supported by the British still, and now they are able to defeat Muzaffar Jang, and Nasir Jang goes on to become the Nawab of of Hyderabad. So, what do you see that in the second anglo carnatic war, those candidates which are being supported by the British they go on to defeat the erstwhile Nawabs of both Karnatik and Hyderabad, eventually resulting in taking up positions both in Hyderabad and Karnatik. And if the British are, and if the British supported candidates finally emerge victorious by 1754, what is going to happen? That the British will now get control over the Hyderabad court and the Karnatik uh, court. Right. So, what do you see is that in the second war, basically Muhammad Ali becomes assassinated Shan Sahib, Nasir Jang assassinates Muzaffar Jang and you see the British coming out powerful from the second anglo carnatic war. But even when the British come out powerful from the second anglo carnatic war, they also reach peace with the French, saying that all trading positions that you have already will not take your trading positions. And you can continue doing trade in the region. Also, we will allow you to have your office. Uh, we'll allow you to even have a partial controlling influence over the Hyderabad court as well. Okay. Now, why are they reaching again? This is because something else is happening in America, where the French are more victorious. So they're fighting in America and they're fighting here. One side is winning here, the other is winning there. So they keep reaching these agreements which allow both of them to maintain presence in one form or the other. And so by the second war, by 1754, you see the war basically ends with a treaty. I don't know how to pronounce it, so I'm not going to make an attempt. You pronounce it if you know French very well and good. If you don't know French, it's okay. You also don't need to announce it. You can keep attempting as long as you can see. Okay. So probably Google it, listen to Google's voice, and see well, how does it pronounce. So whatever you want to uh, pronounce it, you can pronounce it that way. Basically, with this treaty, the British allowed the French to continue maintaining their trading positions, etc., in the region with one more condition. <coughs> That duplex should be sent back. Duplex should not be allowed to continue in India any further because he is the one who keeps creating all the nuisance for the British all the time. So basically, duplex is sent back. Uh, and you see that by the second war, again, that's almost a kind of a stalemate. Right? Yes, the British are on the powerful side, but the French have not been completely wiped away. But this story obviously does not happen end here. But you see that from Actually, we say from 1754 only, but we also, after even this treaty does not hold on for long. And you say that somewhere in some places it is said 1754 itself, some places it says 1757 to 1763. This is also called as the Seven Years War. The Seven Years War. Okay, the Seven Years War basically is again renewed hostilities break out between the English and the French. Ultimately what happens is that finally uh, by in this in this war of 1757 to 63 what happens is by this time what you see is that I told you the French East India Company anyways is uh, a government owned company and the East English East India Company is it and so the crown troops came in to support the East India Company. Now we see that ultimately after this war that breaks out in 1757 that lasts for seven years, finally by 1763 the British decisively defeat the French in the third Anglo-Carnatic 
war the british decisively defeat the french and even after this they allow them to continue trade in india but the french withdraw and refuse to do uh, maintain any further trading positions in india why because now the any the british had completely subdued both hyderabad and karnatak region which were now under their direct or indirect control through the nawabs and the french had no control over the politics of this sphere continuing as a secondary or a junior trading partner in a region to the english was something that went against the french pride at this point of time it wasn't that they were just looking to do trade here also it was a symbol because i told you the french east india company is a government owned company so it is also a reflection of the french empire so the french cannot afford to be a secondary player in the region and thus the french decide to withdraw after 1763 but so that's why we say that with the third anglo carnatic war that ended in 1763 this is the third war which ended in 1763 the anglo french rivalry came to an end in southern india now came to an end in southern india now ye to sari kahani thi nobody is going to directly ask you you know this these chain of events which happened what is important to know is firstly what or uh, what is important to know firstly from our examination point is the you know is the causes of the anglo french rivalry uh, is the causes of the anglo uh, carnatic wars that's first thing to know third secondly what is also to be understood is to talk about the significance of the anglo carnatic wars okay now we'll see that when we talk about the causes of the anglo carnatic wars firstly obviously is the anglo french rivalry that's a major cause of the anglo carnatic wars right that's what we've been talking all the time another major reason is what succession disputes which emerge in both hyderabad and the carnatic region so and the succession disputes are coming because of the absence of a strong central ruler in this particular region after the death of nizam right also another thing that one should and you would be thinking by now is that why is it i have not told you anything about why the french are getting defeated by the british why do you think that the french are getting defeated by the british i'm saying french are defeated by the british they are a state owned company so okay so first so basically the french are a east india are a government owned company and so they have to seek assistance from the government every time see this notion that the government is less powerful is not true in fact when the government intervenes if it wishes to it can discipline any private player so i mean this actually not a reason in the sense that it wasn't uh, the fact that it was a state owned company and was a private owned company that went against the french rather this was something that favored the french because they were being supported by the french empire the east india company had to ask for support from the british empire but and that this is so this is not the reason but there are other reasons yeah so the british had a stronger navy than the french yes one of the major reasons is that the british had uh, or in fact even when the french and the english were uh, both powerful empires by far up till world war 2 the world's biggest and the most powerful navy was that of the english okay so firstly the english were a superior naval power as compared to the french any other reason any other reason that you can think of battle of plassey battle of plassey how you know yeah so what he's saying is the gain of revenue from the battle of plassey uh, also strengthened the british financially more than that actually uh, yes the battle of plassey also had a contributory role but partly what he's saying is correct in the sense that uh, uh, a major another major reason was that the finances of the french or the financial position of the french was weaker as compared to the english that is not 
only it is because of these wars but also because of other reasons also but it's because the french economy itself was inherently weaker than the english economy okay so to that extent another major reason is that financially the french were weaker as compared to the english and so one reason is that the french military is actually which is more powerful than the uh, the english uh, naval strength is more than the french the other is they financially the english are more in a sound position than the french anything else that you can think of i mean you can't think of beyond this because otherwise you have to know it right the mark to apne laga liya finance army all of this no we'll talk about british colonialism throughout the world later but another major reason is the fact that in terms of military organization in terms of military organization after dupleix had been withdrawn the the next french general who had been who had the next individual who had been made the french general in india was count de lally okay we we'll write that count de lally was the one who was made the next military general to head the french forces in india and he was both an arrogant and an inefficient general as compared to dupleix so even that was a reason why a number of french soldiers and middle level french officers in the french army got were very dissatisfied with the policies of count de lally who was in charge so that also basically led to disaffection within the french army itself okay so that was also another reason reason why basically the french were defeated so i gave you three main reasons why the french were actually defeated now this is this is what basically happened so we've talked about the reasons for the french defeat i have also told you some of the causes that led to the anglo carnatic wars what eventually happens with the anglo carnatic war is that the anglo french rivalry comes to an end so what when we talk about the consequences you see of the anglo carnatic wars we say that in terms of consequences we say that with the end of the anglo uh, with the third anglo carnatic war the anglo french rivalry came to an end in the carnatic region in the carnatic region and this allowed from now on the british to focus solely upon the princely states matlab kya abhi tak it was like india today which has to england was english east india company's position was like that of india today which had to prepare for fighting both with indian princely states and also with the french just like india has to prepare for a two front war both with pakistan as well as with china so once one threat is taken care of decisively that is the french now the english could focus solely upon the princely states so the decisive end to the anglo french rivalry made it easier for the british to focus upon the princely states and deal with them in an effective manner so that is why you see that the balance of favor power now decisively shifts in favor of britain because uh, decisively starts shifting in favor of britain because there is no european rivalry that they have to deal with while dealing with indian princely states okay but this does not mean that the role of the french end here but yes major role of the french end with the ends with the anglo french rivalry any doubts still have we will write this down don't worry so yeah when the english defeated french here were the french defeated in america also were the french defeated in america also you will see exactly i mean i was not discussing world history but nonetheless 1763 is the seven year war the seven year war is not said only with reference to india it's also said with reference to america and in 1763 america in america the french are defeated by the english and the whole of canada parts of canada especially the eastern coast of canada and the western coast of united states which were under the control of the french also now come under the control of the british so we say also that the anglo french rivalry also led to the american war of independence that happened later okay so 
we're not getting into world history but yeah there also the french were defeated but you will see having said that the french were defeated in america the french make a comeback in america okay in the sense that 10 years later the french finance the are the ones who finance finance the american war of independence they give the americans the arms the money required to overthrow the french they also send in french soldiers to support the american war of independence against the british that is why it is also said that the american war of independence is more a french war than the american than that of americans okay but okay for now we're not getting to world history yes there also in america also the french were defeated finally they stop fighting and we are get into a peaceful transition to british rule i'm just joking okay. <laughs> so now so this much is clear any more doubts this there or otherwise we'll write this down any more doubts in understanding in the causes the consequences and why the french were defeated these are the three things any doubts no doubts क्या आप सब ऐसे ही रहने वाले हैं क्या कुछ तो पूछिए ओके नथिंग टू राइट दिस देखिए नथिंग टू आस्क इज रिफ्लेक्टेड ऑफ द फैक्ट दैट इधर आई एम अ ग्रेट टीचर दैट इज लाइक मी बीइंग मोदी आई एम ग्रेट ओके आई 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 बट ऑब्वियसली आई अंडरस्टैंड दैट आई एम नॉट सो व्हाट यू नीड टू अंडरस्टैंड इज यू नीड टू ओपन अप मोर व्हाटएवर यू डाउट्स यू हैव द मोर यू आस्क द बेटर इट इज द मोर लाइक शी आस्क जस्ट समथिंग Right? so i could tell you something if you're not going to push me i'm not going to probably either tell you or maybe i'll miss out on a few points so keep asking if you keep asking you know it would even be relatively more interesting now i i can get the hint you don't like my jokes right? i cracked a joke okay <laughs> but nonetheless it's okay political jokes slowly slowly you'll start getting no by by once you've read a number of other things now <clears throat> so what what do we do in terms of causes of the war what do we do in terms of the uh, causes of the anglo carnatic wars is firstly the anglo french rivalry the anglo french rivalry which began dekhi that's how you write okay. the anglo french rivalry which began with the i'm just writing in a short form okay the first anglo carnatic war the first the anglo french rivalry which began with the first anglo carnatic war and led to the initial victory of the french in establishing a preeminent trading position in establishing a preeminent trading position in the region so the anglo french rivalry began with the first anglo carnatic war and led to the initial victory of the french in establishing a preeminent trading position in the region this is something this is one of the major causes and but the anglo french rivalry obviously does not stop here right and what fuels what gives the french anglo french rivalry a chance to intervene or to shape the politics of the carnatic region is the succession disputes that emerged after the death of agar aapko nahi yaad aaye na to nawab of carnatic in or nawab of hyderabad in 1740s 1740s 48 bhi nahi yaad hai koi baat nahi hai so or after that but i am writing for the sake of completeness asif jahan 
one. You don't need to see. I'm not writing here in bracket 1742 to 48. You don't need to waste your time and energy on remembering the years. Okay. So seven. आप ऐसे याद रख लीजिए. 1740s first Anglo-Carnatic War. 1750s second Anglo-Carnatic War. 1760s third Anglo-Carnatic War. That's it. Don't need to get too much sentimental about the dates. So, the succession disputes that emerged after the death of Asaf Jahan I provided a fertile ground for English and French interventions. For provided a fertile ground for English and French interventions. Fine. Third major cause. <coughs> Apart from succession disputes and the Anglo-French rivalry, we could also add that in terms of causes. Uh, okay, we'll we'll leave it for later. You can probably leave some days. We'll come to that later. Okay. So, in terms of the major causes that we say is the Anglo-French rivalry and, you know, uh, the succession disputes which allowed the Anglo-French rivalry to play out, ultimately leading to the overthrow of the French after the third. So, what is the Significance. The significance of this Anglo Carnatic Wars is firstly it firstly brings an end to the Anglo French. I'm writing in short, but as I'm telling you, you don't need to. Uh, brings an end to the Anglo-French rivalry in southern in southern India would be wrong but in the Carnatic and Hyderabad region it allows the British to now focus upon regional states given that there was no fear of a direct French intervention. <coughs> Another significance which is related to both of them and something that I've already told you that it is Anglo-French rivalry which brought in the crown troops into India, right? And this once the crown troops came in India, especially initially to support, to, you know, dislodge the French, they continued to stay on in India and the East India Company was from now on supported by the British Army itself. This was on the condition that the East India Company would pay an annual revenue to the British Parliament. Okay, that we'll see later. But basically, they had to pay, you know, it's like if it's a one time affair, the, the government can probably come to the rescue of one of its companies. For example, if a ship of an Indian company gets hijacked by pirates, then obviously the Indian Navy would come to the rescue. But if they have to constantly provide support to one company all the time, then obviously the government will ask for it. For example, CISM today is deployed at the centers of 
the Central Industrial Security Force is today deployed at the center of uh, major IT companies also, Baba's companies also. So, who's Baba? Ramdev's company is the only company who, which has been a mere span of one and a half year, got the protection from the CISF. It's unparalleled in Indian economy ever. Okay. And, and his growth also has a, uh, is also unparalleled. So what do you see? That CISF charges from all these companies. Infosys has to pay a charge. Every company has to pay a charge for the services that the government is offering to protect them and give them security. To that extent, even the East India Company had to offer. But what is more important is that from now on, with this, with the crown troops coming in India, with the entry of crown troops to tackle the French threat, the balance of power was decisively the balance of power decisively shifted in favor of English. Decisively shifted in favor of English against against the Indian princely. States. The balance of power decisively shifted in the favor of British against the Indian princely states. So we see that these are the three major significance, one or two more minor significances are there in the BBT. You can read them on your own. But these are the major ones. Okay. Now, so these are the causes, these are the significance, right? And finally, let's everybody's written this, right? Finally, let's write out something about something about the reasons for the French failure. Reasons for French defeat. The reasons for the French defeat firstly is the English naval superiority over the French, obviously naval superiority over the French. The second, financially, the French East India Company was in a weaker position than the English. The third reason, as I told you already, is the rashness and arrogance of Count de Lally. alienated a number of the crashness and arrogance of County Lali alienated a number of French soldiers thus weakening the force thus weakening the French forces further Okay. thus weakening the French forces further. Rashness and arrogance of Count de Lally alienated <coughs> alienated a number of French soldiers thus weakening uh, alienated a number of French soldiers thus weakening the forces the French forces further. So, these are the reasons, major reasons for the French defeat as well. So, I've given you some three or four major reasons, uh, three or four major causes for the war, three or four major significance and three or four major uh, 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 
reasons for the war, right? Causes, significance and also the reasons for the failure of the French. One thing that I want to again tell you, never either in history or in any other subject, okay, one thing also, you know, like after some point of time, you should learn to use what resources you already have more optimally rather than, you know, looking for resources all the time in different places. So, because we often feel that what we have in hand is not sufficient, right? So, for example, uh, in your in your vision student platform, you'll also see, I think, uh, later or even now, uh, there would be some uh, copies of, uh, or even on the vision portal, you'll see some of the uh, previous test papers and copies of previous year's toppers <coughs> would be uploaded, okay? So, I'm not saying that in India, we do something like topper worship. Okay, this thing. Ambedkar said we are a country which likes to worship. We can worship anybody and everybody. From our politicians to our businessmen to maybe exam toppers. Right? So, don't look at exam toppers as their epitomes of virtue. Okay? They've also gone through a process. They've also gone through a cycle. And the fact that there are no paragons of virtue, I'm not saying that they're not talented. I'm saying that they are talented, but does not mean that they're talented, they need to be worshipped. What I'm basically trying to say is a bigger point here. You go and see their copies, which are uploaded on the platform, after a few, after some time, not now. When you will see their answers, what will you realize is the beauty of their effort is that they put across their point simply. Not trying to give it a very flowery language, not trying to show their literary expertise. No, they stick to what is the demand of the answer. Don't try to, they don't try to give an oh my god amazing introduction. Okay. And we'll talk about answer writing later. But one of the things that you should go and do is when you see their copies, you will see their emphasis is on just writing the points. That's why I'm telling you to just focus on the points. Upper niche ek line, upper ek niche aap aise bhi likh lenge. As long as you know that these are my three points that I have to write. Because when you keep asking what answer writing, answer writing, the first battle is to have to know the content. The second battle is to organize the content in points that you can concretely produce. And the third is about probably a bit about conclusion, etc. that we will talk about later. And also about writing, etc. But nonetheless, what I want, why I am saying that you should see their copies after some time is because you will realize that there is no rocket science in this exam. What this exam demands is consistency, <laughs> persistence and also realizing that fighting out the whole exam at an average level is more important than writing few exceptional answers and the rest of useless answers. You write only points in all answers you will score much better than you try to write a very amazing introduction and a very amazing conclusion. You do that for the first five questions. For the next 15, you realize time is running out. So you are also running. Okay. So it should not happen that way. Okay. So that's why I'm saying that why I keep drawing this and though it's not in your PPT in this manner, why I keep drawing this is that this is what you're going to take away. If you have points, that is what matters. You know the story. What happened in the war, who killed whom, it does not matter. Okay, nobody is going to ask you that. Probably then talk about events that led to the war. If the question right, if the question is discuss the events that led to the three anglo carnatic wars, then what are the events? You just remember the events that I drew on the board. That's it. Okay. The first war ended with the French victory, the second and the third war ended with the English victory. Ultimately, in 1763, with the end of the Seven Year War, came also something, I have not I have forgotten to write the name. The name is the Treaty of Paris. The Treaty of Paris happened, you need to remember the name of this treaty. The Treaty of Paris came after the Third anglo Carnatic War in 1763. And with this treaty, the French withdrew their direct presence from India. That's something that you can add in that timeline. That's all that you need to remember. Okay. So decrease your information load. The whole aim of coming to a class is not just to understand, but also to decrease your information load, not to increase your load. That ye bhi padh lena, ye bhi padh lena, ye bhi padh lena. Okay. So that will not happen eventually. So that's there. Is this much clear? Fine. 
Okay. Ten minutes more? No? Okay. Uh, so, see, because we couldn't start on time today, my fault, I understand, not yours. But forgive me. Okay. So, the next thing that we'll talk about today is just a brief introduction, and that is about Mesur. Okay, we'll take detailed Mesur tomorrow, but just something just in brief about Mesur. See, when we talk about Hyderabad, I didn't talk that Hyderabad was a very strong economy at any point of time. I didn't talk about any major administrative changes that Hyderabad brought about. We talked in brief about how Bengal was a major economy, right? And how in Bengal some administrative changes were brought about by the Nawabs there. But Mysur is important because of a few very defining reasons. We'll see later tomorrow uh, that Mysur in many ways differed from almost all other princely states of this time, whether Hyderabad or Bengal or Marathas or the central Mughal ruler. Mysur was relatively more unique as well as different from all other regional states of the same time because we'll see there was Hyder Ali and there was then later his son, Tipu Sultan, who were the key players who played a very important role in learning from the mistakes of other princely states and bringing about significant changes in their structure of the army, significant changes in their economy, significant, when we talk about economy, significant changes in both revenue collection as well as in the way they organize their agriculture. Okay. Also, they were also the ones who made an, played an, uh, gave an important emphasis also upon modernizing their military in the sense that they were one of the first uh, Indian states to set up an arsenal factory separately to produce arms and to invest in more technology in the military. Okay. So that was one thing. Even to reorganize their army, they looked upon the experiences of the Europeans for, and they also took French assistance in uh, they, uh, they took French expertise, they took the help of French expertise to reorganize their army completely. So you'll see that whether it was the French military, whether it was uh, the Mesur's army, whether it was their agriculture, they had brought in significant reforms. Okay, And this is one of the reasons that Mesur was a very strong economy as well as a strong military power. And just like we say that the Mughals were the, next, were the pan Indian empire, Mysore, the aim Mysore had for itself, both Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan, was to become a preeminent power of South India. They didn't see, you know, like, they didn't want to expand upwards north or anything. Now one could ask why they didn't want to expand upwards north. Firstly, because there was no conception of an India then. It, it isn't that they felt that this is India and we want to capture the whole of India. They wanted to, they wanted their uh, control over both the coasts. Because in their because in their understanding, the control of the coast was important to control trade. And if you could control trade, you would be a strong empire. So their vision was their vision was limited to becoming a preeminent power of South India and control the trading positions in both the western coast as well as the eastern coast. Okay. So that was but also, so this was something that was there. And we also say that, you know, in 18th century India, if there was one state, just like this question was asked about, you know, the how after Palasi, uh, India entered in a modern age. In a similar way, apart from other, in, in uh, stark contrast to other princely states, Mysore was one state where one could see the establishment of a modern state establishment of a modern military. When I say modern, I'm not saying progressive. The word modern can also be used to mean progressive. When we talk in social issues, we say modern is progressive. When we talk in political structure, we say modern is the coming of democracy, the coming of accountability. But when I'm saying an administrative structure in a context of the same word, that is why modern can be used in many different ways. <laughs> But when I'm saying in terms of an administrative structure, what we are referring to is relatively newer forms of the word modern here means only new. Okay, the newer forms of administration which is associated with the new forms of state that exist today. That they had a separate dedicated military, they had a separate band of revenue collecting officials. So you have for example IRS today, the Indian Revenue Service, charges, task is to collect taxes. 
or ensure that taxes are collected on time. So a similar revenue collecting uh, salaried officials is what they had. They had a separate specialized military, for example, in the Indian Army, which is a separate army, does not have any revenue collecting responsibilities. They also gave a push to agriculture. They invested significantly in increasing area under irrigation. Okay, so as to increase agricultural productivity. They understood, don't worry, we'll write all that later. Okay, just probably not today, but we'll write it tomorrow. But I'm just telling it to you today. So also they understood that if agricultural productivity had to be increased, they had also they also needed to ensure that those crops are grown which have a higher market value. So on the one side, they increased area under irrigation. On the other side, they also promoted the cultivation of silk or sericulture because silk was a valued commodity in Europe. So they wanted to export silk and silk-based commodities to Europe as well as to Central Asia, okay, through Persia, etc., or through Iran, etc. So that was there. So they were investing. They, want, they also pushed their farmers towards cash crops because that would increase the revenue for the state. They also realized that if the French could establish the East India Company, if the British could establish the East India Company or their own trading companies, why couldn't Mesur establish its own trading company? And so there was a state-owned trading company also established by Mesur to sell their goods directly in European and Central Asian countries and establish trade relations with Europeans as well as Central Asian countries. Also, he understood they understood that they need to also take up activities in the manufacturing sector in the sense that they also set up a manufacturing company for the first time in the 1780s. So you see that by far as compared to other princely states and other regional states of 18th century India, Mysore is far ahead in terms of organizing itself. This is also the reason you will see, I didn't tell you in that map that I drew that you know that Hyderabad that the British are first taking out Hyderabad or uh, Bengal and then Mysore and then Marathas. You, this is also the reason I didn't tell you there that it wasn't that the British were fighting one by one all the princely states or simultaneously fighting just all the princely states. Or a number of these princely states were also actually siding with the British against the other princely state. For example, Marathas were a major threat to Bengal and Hyderabad. So Hyderabad wanted and would would be very happy if Marathas would be subdued. Similarly, Mesur was a very strong military power in the region and territorially threatened both the Marathas and Hyderabad. The result is that out of the four anglo mysore wars that we'll discuss, three wars were fought not just by the British, but by the British and the Marathas and Hyderabad together against Mysore. And still Mysore was able to hold on for a significant period of time where they were not just fighting against the British but also other princely states who were colluding with the British. So to that extent, the reason why we'll see later and we'll talk about subsidiary alliance and other things also. So just, you know, I in Hyderabad we, should, uh, we could have also talked about subsidiary alliance but I, want, I didn't want to burden you too much. So we'll come, we'll see that uh, the, though the British were signing subsidiary alliance systems of which were kinds of indirect agreements with a number of other princely states, Mysore refused to become a junior partner to the British even till the very last. And it could sustain itself for so long primarily because it had a strong economy. But even then it could not completely overthrow the British because of some other reasons that we'll talk about later. So this is just a primer to tell you because we'll see tomorrow that there are certain questions that can be asked in terms of comparing how was the Mughal administrative structure or how was Mysore's administrative structure an advancement over the other 18th century counterparts or to what extent Mysore represented a modern state in 18th century India as compared to the other regional counterparts. So we'll talk about all of that. We'll talk about the causes of anglo mysur war. We'll talk about uh, the characteristics of Mysore state and the significance of the anglo mysur war, after which we'll move to Maratha. Any other doubts still there? Clear? Please go back and read the PPT. And, uh, ma'am? Ma 
we have a class tomorrow we have a class tomorrow also. okay so we'll see you tomorrow then